So since I was a bit uh, rushed at the end of the last lecture, just let me briefly uh, wrap up what I intended to say uh, for lecture three before we move on to lecture four. Uh, now, in the last lecture, um, uh, I have discussed how different swarmland conjectures can constrain a model of large field inflation. But I don't want to give you the impression that this is the only arena at which the swarmland conjectures can be applied. Uh, another place where you can apply the weak gravity conjecture is on the QCD axion. So remember that the weak gravity conjecture is a correlated constraint on the axion field range uh, and the instanton action. So for the QCD axion, uh, we could uh, put in some numbers for the instanton actions uh, up to some mild UV, uh, up to some mild log uh, corrections. Uh, this translates to a bound on the QCD axions to be of the order of 10 to the um, 16 GeV, roughly around the gut scale. Now, while this is weaker than the commonly quoted cosmological bounds, uh, scenarios that allow for larger axion decay constants have been proposed. And so it's uh, still interesting to see if these predictions of the weak gravity conjecture can be ruled out. And in fact, there are experimentalists trying to look for QCD axions with decay constants around the gut scale. Uh, you can search for such axions uh, through laboratory searches. Uh, one of these experiments is called Abracadabra at MIT. So they were trying to look for uh, uh, the QCD axions through some uh, interesting uh, technologies. And also, uh, a QCD axion with uh, a decay constant of the order of the gut scale could lead to something called the super radiance instability of a black hole. And so this is detectable through gravitational wave observatories, such as LIGO. Okay, so this is another place where the weak gravity conjecture can be applied to constrain uh, not only inflation, but also some aspects of particle physics. So to summarize the lecture, the last lecture, uh, I have shown that uh, I've described how models of inflation that could give rise to detectable level of gravitational waves are sensitive to UV physics. And one way to see it is that uh, at least for a large class of models where um, uh, inflation is realized by a single field, uh, detectable level of gravitational waves means that the field range is super pumpkin. And so the potential for the infraton is subject to all kinds of corrections, uh, even though the UV scale is much higher than the scale of inflation for super Planckian field range, these effects could not be ignored. And I have shown how the weak gravity conjecture and the swarmland distance conjecture can constrain the infraton field range for some models, but not all models of inflation. And hence, this conjecture can be used to uh, constrain the amplitude of the gravitational wave uh, generated by some models of inflation. Um, now, uh, in the first lecture, I already uh, pointed out that the weak gravity conjecture can be generalized to arbitrary p form. So even though the original weak gravity conjecture was stated for one form gauge fields. However, the zero form case is more subtle uh, because the corresponding charge objects are instantons. So we cannot directly make the argument in the same way as we did for one form gauge fields. Nonetheless, we have argued um, how the one zero form of the weak gravity conjecture follows from arguments like duality or consistency with dimensional reduction. So the end result is a correlated constraints on the axion decay constant and the instanton action. And so th this form of the weak gravity conjecture has been used to rule out some models of axion inflation, simple models of that type. Although, as I also pointed out in the, lecture last, uh, in the last lecture, there are loopholes. In particular, you can easily evade some of these conjectures by postulating that there are some additional instantons that give a very negligible effects to the potential. But nonetheless, they are present to satisfy the conjecture. Uh, now, more interesting case would be the axion monodromy type because they are not directly ruled out by the weak gravity conjecture. And upon closer investigation, they are, they are still compatible with the swarmland distance conjecture if you are only looking for a field range that is somewhat bigger than the Planck scale but not parametrically big. And there may be other quantum gravity considerations that uh, could, could uh, put constraints on this model, but we are not aware of them at the moment. And before we find out what they are, we should keep an open mind. And finally, uh, I quickly sketched the argument when you apply the weak gravity conjecture to the QCD axions would imply a decay constant that is testable, or at least rule out, you can rule out models of this type uh, through laboratory axion searches or uh, through gravitational wave detections. Okay. So that's the summary of the last lecture. And 
Now we turn to the last lecture. And uh, recall this uh, slide that I show in the first lecture. And uh, as you have seen, uh, there are various conjectures about quantum gravity uh, that go under different names. And we have already covered quite a lot, where we have mentioned the conjecture of no global symmetry in the first lecture, the weak gravity conjecture, and, um, and stronger versions of the weak gravity conjectures, such as the sublattice or the tower weak gravity conjecture. Okay? And so the subject of the last lecture is um, the so-called non-supersymmetric ADS instability conjecture and the decitic conjecture. And what is common among these two conjectures is that these are proposed consistency conditions for quantum gravity in the absence of supersymmetry. Okay? So both conjectures are in one way or the other saying that there is some instability for uh, non-supersymmetric uh, vacua uh, of string theory. So let's start with the decitic conjecture. Okay? And I also promised that at the end of the lecture I will come back to this slide again to see how they all fit into this web. Um, some bits and pieces are already clear from uh, the lectures up to this point, how they are related, but part of the purpose of these lectures is to see how further conjectures can be related through arguments of the type that I'm going to describe. Okay. So first, the De Sitter conjecture. Okay. Um, the motivation is that um, despite lots of efforts in constructing De Sitter vacuum and string theory, uh, explicit and controlled De Sitter vacuum still, still seems hard to come by. And um, you, know, you can debate on whether the models are explicit enough, uh, but you know, there are still, you know, as far as I can see, um, there are still a lot of room for improvement. Um, so we don't, in, in my opinion, there isn't a fully explicit and controlled distributed vacuum that have been constructed. Uh, much of the discussions are at the level of a proposed scenario rather than a detailed model. So you could bring in ingredients that seems reasonable, and they seems to be, they, you seem to be able to put them together into something that looks, that to construct something like the sitter. Whether all these ingredients can be put together explicitly in an explicit uh, string compactification remains an open question. Now, there have also been attempts to find simpler models of the uh, sitter uh, back here in string theory without some of the complicated ingredients like anti-brains or gay genome condensate non perturbative effects. Uh, just looking at classical uh, this is a vacuum in uh, type 2 supergravity, just by turning on fluxes and so on. And those attempts in finding simpler this is a vacuum run into potentials with too steep a gradient, or sometimes tachyonic directions. So none of them seems to be, give rise to a successful this is a vacuum. And so this state of affairs have motivated one to conjecture that perhaps this is a universal behavior of potentials in string theory. We don't know. Uh, but uh, the question is whether this is a feature that you see from the known examples that have been proposed so far, or there's some very general argument why we expect an unstable decitor vacuum would arise. And so part of the purpose of the first part of the lecture is to give some general physics arguments why and when we expect this kind of behavior to occur. Why in a lot of these situations we run into a potential with a very steep gradient or uh, some unstable directions. Okay. Now, the starting point for the argument is the Swamland distance conjecture that I introduced in the first lecture. And the conjecture states that as you approach any infinite distance locus in the moduli space, uh, you ought to find an infinite tower of states that becomes exponentially light. Okay. So that's the conjecture. Um, this conjecture has been tested. And one simple example of realizing this conjecture is to consider compactification on the circle. So uh, no matter whether you go to the limit when the radius of the compact circle is large or small, you find that there is a tower of states that becomes light, in fact, exponentially light, uh, as the conjecture stated. And uh, if you go to the large radius limit, when you approach infinite radius limit, the tower of states that becomes light is a closer Klein mode. As you go to the opposite limit, when you go to the uh, limit when the circle becomes extremely small, the tower of states that becomes like it would be the widening modes. Okay? Now, this conjecture holds more generally than this simple example. Um, as far as I know, there's no counter example that have been fine. And um, it has also passed some non-trivial tests, at least for theories with 
sufficient uh, number of supersymmetries where we can trace the states that becomes light. Um, so, um, right. Now, in the last lecture, I mentioned that there are some subtleties regarding the onset of this exponential behavior, um, uh, whether it happens around the Planck scale or can be significantly larger than the Planck scale. And there are still some open questions, as I mentioned previously, uh, at, at regarding when the onset of this exponential uh, behavior would occur. But these subtleties do not affect the proposed universal behavior at infinite distance which is the regime where we will make use of this conjecture to make our argument. So keep in mind that there are some subtleties regarding you know, when you expect this tower of states to become light. It's not necessarily always of the Planckian distances, but you know, if you go to infinite distances, there's no, uh, uh, the, the issues that I mentioned in the last lecture would not apply. And this is the regime where we will make use of this uh, Swarmland distance conjecture to make, the to make our entropy argument. Okay? So now just a few words about What's the motivation for this conjecture? Um, the underlying motivation for the Swarmland distance conjecture is duality. Okay? So as you go to large distances um, in field space, uh, you often find that the original description breaks down. Rather, uh, the physics is better described by the new degrees of freedom that becomes light. Okay? This is uh, not a new story. Uh, this is, in fact, what happened in string duality. Uh, no matter which limits of, string of M theory you start with, as you go to large enough field distances in field space, the original descriptions fails to be the good one. Uh, when you, uh, you can connect type 2A theory with type 2B by you know, undergoing uh, a large distance in one of the compact directions, and you can go back and forth between uh, heterotic string and type 1 string theory by dialing the coupling constant. So whether this is the string coupling constant or some geometrical moduli, as you go to large enough distances, you find that uh, typically the original description breaks down, and the physics is better described by the new degrees of freedom, the new tower of states that becomes light. And one point that would be useful for our discussion uh, in this lecture is that uh, in string theory, all the coupling constants are scalar fields. Uh, the dilaton is a scalar field, the geometrical moduli that describes the size or shape of the extra dimensions, they are scalar fields. And when we go to uh, the parametrically weak coupling limit, we are going to an infinite distance in field space. So the statements that we are going to make would be at the parametrically weak coupling regime when you go to arbitrary weak coupling. And that means we are bringing ourselves to the boundary of the moduli space. Okay. So we can interpret what this formal distance conjecture says uh, as the following. So any given weakly coupled region of string theory, which means that we are at the boundary of the moduli space, the physics should be better described in terms of the tower of states that becomes light. And uh, the tower of states could be, as in the last lecture, some wrap D3 brains. It could be some closer climb modes or KK or winding modes. Uh, so if you go to the boundary of the moduli space, you find that there is a new description, not in terms of the original degrees of freedom, but in terms of the new states that are the light degrees of freedom at that region of the moduli space. So what the Swarmland distance conjecture says is that with any weakly coupled region of string theory should have a dual description in terms of this tower of like states. And so uh, in this lecture, I will argue how this tower of like states can, can potentially provide a dual description of the scalar potential as well as the associated entropy. Okay. So this is how we draw the connections between the distance conjecture and the de Sitter conjecture. A priori, they seem to be unrelated, but uh, you will see a connection when we try to uh, provide a dual description of a potential, like a positive energy potential, in terms of this new tower of states that you expect at the boundary of the moduli space. Okay? So the argument goes as follows. Um, so uh, just like a, a black hole, uh, the fact that you have a horizon for this is the space, you can associate an entropy with it. Uh, the entropy of uh, this is the space is given by the uh, Gibbons-Hawking formula. Uh, it's proportional to the area of the horizon, which is set by the cosmological constant. And um, uh, this, this is a macroscopic entropy. And this entropy has been interpreted in terms of the dimensions of the Hilbert space of, um, uh, of the Zeta space, uh, but according to a, a, an observer's causal domain. Okay, so if you have an observer in a causal domain, you can count the Hilbert space. The dimension of the Hilbert space should be associated uh, 
should be provide a microscopic interpretations of the de Sitter entropy. Okay? Now, for the purpose of the de Sitter conjecture, we are interested not only in the cosmological constant. After all, we are trying to see how this behavior of a sharp uh, uh, gradient of the potential could arise. So we are interested in situations where the potential is positive. And in general, it could have, um, it, it's not a constant. It could vary with the field. Um, if the potential has a local minimum, um, and if the minimum is sufficiently long-lived, we can associate entropy with it, just like how we would do it for exact sitter space. Um, however, even if the potential has a non-zero uh, gradient, as long as the gradient is not too big, um, you have an accelerating space-time with an associate apparent horizon. And so with an apparent horizon, you can uh, count its entropy according to this Gibbons Hawking formula. So the point is that the apparent horizon is always, yeah. How do you often the gradient of the apparent horizon? Yeah, so the, at, at, it, you know, um, it would be given by the Hubble scale. And since it's changing but not changing very rapidly, you can uh, evaluate the horizon in terms of the Hubble parameter. So that's, that's uh, what we call, what we mean by the apparent horizon here. Okay. Now, if the gradient is big, then you lose an accelerating uh, space time and you don't have an apparent horizon. And then you cannot make use of this argument to associate entropy with the potential or with the Hubble scale. Okay. Now, um, the point is that the apparent horizon is always inside of the cosmic event horizon, which is not always guaranteed to exist. But if it exists, it's always inside of the cosmic event horizon. Um, the light rays emanating from uh, the apparent horizon will always cross at caustics. And this allows us to bound the entropy in the region of the cold shear surface um, encroached by the apparent horizon. Now, this is a semi classical picture, uh, and this is only true when the quantum fluctuations are small. And this is the case when the potential is not, uh, when the potential is not, tachyon is not too tachyonic. Uh, you can work out um, the scalar fluctuation in this background. And if the Hessian of the potential has two negative and eigenvalue, uh, with a value below a certain scale set by the de Sitter radius, um, you find that uh, the zero point fluctuations of the uh, the zero point fluctuations in this background will become tachyonic at horizon crossing. So this semi classical picture is no longer good. So we can only make this argument associating the entropy with the potential uh, of a positive uh, potential if the potential is positive and satisfy these two criteria. Namely, you don't lose the apparent horizon; you have an accelerating space time, and the fluctuations. The, the, sorry, the Hessian of the potential is not too negative such that the fluctuations become tachyonic and that uh, invalidate this semi-classical picture. And another way to think of it is that the second conditions, that the Hessian is not too negative, ensure that the first equality is satisfied for at least one Hubble time. And if you're familiar with, the, uh, with inflation, you can recognize that these two conditions are nothing but the conditions on the two slow world parameters. Epsilon parameter, being smaller than one, ensure that you have an accelerating space time. And the eta parameter, if it is smaller than, uh, if it is not too negative, then it would ensure that the uh, accelerating space time maintained over a Hubble uh, time scale. OK, now, uh, so we are going to make a connections between this entropy with the potential, and from which deduce how the potential should behave in the parametrically weak coupling regime. As we mentioned, in the weak coupling regime, uh, we expect a tower of like states with exponentially small masses. This is what the Swarmland distance conjecture tells us. Um, so as you go to the parametrically weak coupling regime, you will expect a lot of like states below your cutoff of the theory. Okay? So you could try to parameterize how many like states there are um, and count the entropy. So, if the mass of the states is exponentially light with the field, with a given cutoff, the number of states below the cutoff should be exponentially big with the field. So that's why the number of states below the cutoff should grow exponentially with the field. Uh, I parameterize it by a parameter b, some order one number times the field 
uh, in general, there could be multiple towers that becomes light. So in the simple example of compactification on the circle, there's only one modulus. So I have only one tower of states, the winding states or the closer kind states. But in general, if you go to the boundary of the moduli space, you could have multiple towers that become light. Okay? So to be more general, you could, ask, uh, you could parameterize the number of towers of states that become light uh, as you go to the boundary of the moduli space. So the number of states below the cutoff uh, can be written in this form. There's an exponential dependence due to the Swarmland distance conjecture, and this is a factor that would uh, account for more general situations. Now, we expect, as you go to the boundary of the moduli space, when you go to the parametrically weak coupling regime, more and more towers would become light. So the number of towers that uh, becomes light would increase monotonically. This is an assumption. And this all the one factor here depends on the mass gap and other features of the tower. So if your tower of states has a mass gap given, um, you know, so in the case of the collusive client states, we exactly know what this mass gap is. And so you can compute this order one number. So this is just a way to parameterize the number of like, like states below a certain cutoff and see how we could associate this with the entropy of this city space. So if we assume that this tower of like states account for the decitta entropy, you could uh, try to uh, relate. Uh, um, you could try to relate the entropy with the um, with the number of states in this tower, as well as the decitta radius. Okay. Uh, now uh, we expect that the entropy would grow with the number of states below the cutoff. So this should be a function that increases with the number of states below the cutoff. And it should also depend on the de Sitter radius as well. And um, we have seen that uh, if you take the Gibbons hopping uh, formula, it grows with the de Sitter radius. And so it, without knowing how to count the entropy associated with these like states, we can first do this most naive thing, which is to parameterize this entropy as a function of the number of like states as well as the de Sitter radius. So we could argue that since we are talking about very large number of states and a large decitta radius, uh, the entropy function, even if we don't know what is this form, will be dominated by a single term since they are all large numbers. Independently, they should grow with n and with r. So one of these terms will be dominated. And so I can describe the entropy associated with this tower as n to some power gamma and the decitta radius to some power of delta. Now, in some simple examples, I can show you how to compute this power, but just this is a way to parameterize the entropy associated with this tower. And if this tower of states dominates, um, um, if this tower of states dominate the Hilbert space as we go to the parametrically weak coupling regime, it's not so unreasonable to expect that they would also dominate the entropy. And so we know that the entropy is bounded by uh, the decitta horizon, uh, the decitta radius. And so this entropy of the tower should be bounded by R squared. Okay, so this is the Busso Pang applied to the tower. And uh, if we expect, if we assume that this uh, tower of states saturate this bound, you could uh, set them to be equal. And this gives us relations between the potential, which scale with the uh, inverse square of the decitta radius with the number of states. Through this uh, Busso bound, if you saturate this bound, you could find the relations between the number of states and the decitta radius. And hence, uh, the potential should behave as some powers of the number of states that becomes light. Okay? So th this is the connection that we use to um, obtain the decitta conjecture. Okay? Now, what does the decitta conjecture tell us? Well, it's a con condition relating the gradient of the potential with the potential itself. But the fact that um, we know how the potential scale with the number of states, and the fact that the number of states grow exponentially with the field, tells us that the gradient of the potential uh, would follow uh, this exponential behavior. Uh, the, the gradient of the potential is tied to the potential itself. Uh, with the gradients set by the scale of the potential. Okay, so let me just say it one more time. Uh, uh, so this 
number of states that are below a cutoff, as we parameterize, is given by the number of towers times e to some order one number times phi. You can just take the gradient of this potential and find that this decider conjecture is satisfied with the particular parameters that I introduced before. So if all of these are order one numbers, then the decider conjecture seems to hold. Okay. Uh, now, with one caveat, because a prerequisite for having a notion of entropy is, as I mentioned, that the Hessian of the potential is not too negative. If the Hessian of the potential is too negative, then the semi-classical picture breaks down. So the decider conjecture has to be supplemented with an additional condition, namely that the Hessian cannot be too negative. And so this naturally led to the so-called refined decider conjecture, which uh, can be stated as follows. Either you find that the gradient of the potential satisfies the original decider conjecture, or the minimum of the Hessian is very negative. Okay? So if one of these conditions is satisfied, then uh, the analysis that I sketched for you would hold. So this is the origin of the uh, refined decider conjecture. And notice that we are only, only making statements in the parametrically weak coupling regime. Away from the parametrically weak coupling regime, we cannot make use of the Swanland distance conjecture. And hence, there's no reason why this relation should hold. We are only making statements when you go, can go to arbitrary weak coupling. Okay. Now, uh, there's an interesting uh, consequence of this refinement that we made. Uh, shortly after the original decider conjecture was stated, which is only the first condition here, several groups have pointed out. Huh? Yes. Sorry, you probably, you probably explained this already. I missed it. Uh, when you say distance in the field space, and in particular with Dilaton involved, it yeah. sort of depends on which frame you are in. Yes. Are, are you always working in Einstein frame? Yeah. So, so this this is a distance in the field space. So I would use the field space metric to compute distances. But that depends on which, whether it's Einstein frame or string frame in the case of Dilaton, right? Because exponential factor either exists or not exist mm -hmm. uh, between string frame and Einstein frame. So I was wondering which frame are we referring to? Right. So, um, so since we are normalizing things in the Planck unit, so it should be in the Einstein frame that we compute. But in general, if it is not a dilaton, it's all dependent on what is the field space metric. So I, I want to make a more general statement because it's not necessarily the coupling constant associated with the dilaton. It could be, say, some geometrical moduli or some decompactify limit. Um, so uh, to be general, I just keep it to be a field, field space metric. OK, so uh, an interesting consequence of this refinement that we made is that, uh, well, shortly after the original conjecture was made, several groups have pointed out that uh, the conjecture made earlier was a bit too strong. If you do not supplement it with the additional uh, refinement, then you can already take some known examples and rule it out. And the argument can be as simple as following. So suppose you find that the, weak, the, swarmland, uh, the decider conjecture is satisfied at you know, our electro weak vacuum. Just move the Higgs field up to the top of the potential doesn't change the gradient of the potential, because you are still at a critical point. Nonetheless, you change the potential significantly. So by just moving the hex field among all the other modular field in your theory, just moving it to the top of the potential would violate the, weak, uh, the, the decider conjunction badly, simply because the potential scale up tremendously when you move up to the potential in the units, that, um, in the units of interest. Nonetheless, this refinement save the day because um, you can see that uh, the Hessian condition is satisfied uh, with flying colors. So it is super uh, negative. And so the, even though the original statement about the decider conjecture is violated, the refinement, uh, the refined condition is satisfied. So this still satisfies the refined decider conjecture. Now, there are also um, papers that pointed out uh, that not only the Higgs you can cause problem. You can consider the pions uh, in, uh, or the QCD axions just by moving the field up and down the potential. You can violate the decider conjecture. In such cases, you can argue that um, the Hessian condition is satisfied because of the weak gravity conjecture. Um, the minimum, the, the Hessian of the potential is tied to the axion decay constant. And so we have already shown in the previous lecture that the axion decay constant is subplanking. 
And so the potential is negative enough to satisfy the refined de Sitter conjecture. Okay. So, um, so recall that uh, we have made the assumption, several assumptions in arriving at this, at this conclusion. Uh, the assumptions are the following, that even though the original swarmland distance conjecture applies to moduli space when there's no potential, we assume that it works even in the presence of a potential. Then you know, there are still directions in the field space where we can go to parametrically recoupling regime. This is assumption number one. The second assumption is that we are in a weak coupling regime where the tau of states is a dual description. If the tau of states is not a dual description, we cannot account for the entropy entirely in terms of this tau of states. Finally, uh, we are maintaining a quasi de Sitter setting. Namely, uh, we have an apparent horizon. Otherwise, we cannot associate an entropy. And under this assumption, we can show that uh, this, uh, either one of these conditions should hold. Now, uh, one point I want to emphasize here is that uh, when we derive the de Sitter conjecture, it's pretty much insensitive to how we count the microstate. Right? So I show you how to parameterize the entropy in terms of this uh, function. It grows with the number of states, it grows with the number, with the de Sitter radius. We don't know what these powers are, but under very general assumptions about these powers, we can still get this all in one factor. However, the, uh, even though the de Sitter conjecture is insensitive to the details of the microstate counting, the cosmology depends sensitively to it. In particular, what is the mass gap of this tower of states depends on how we count the entropy. And uh, you know, in some way of counting the entropy, you find that the mass gap is too small. And so even though they could be uh, a dark tower of states, if they are too light, they are severely constrained by experiments. So we, could, we would like to do a little bit better. Uh, so the question is, can we count the entropy of this tower of states, not just by parametrizing it, but by trying to come up with some models in which we can do the counting? Unfortunately, uh, it is a very tall order. Um, nobody knows how to count the, microscopically the de Sitter entropy by enumerating the states in the Hilbert space of quantum gravity. Right? This is um, a long-standing problem. Uh, so what we can do is just to find some simple toy model to compute um, where we can actually trust the computation. And so we would only be able to compute a subset of the states in the Hilbert space by considering only three particles. Okay. So there are a lot more states that you could count. For instance, uh, there could be black hole states, there could be states that are um, not well within the de Sitter horizon but localized on the horizon of the Sitter. Uh, but we are only counting states that are described by three. Uh, we are only describing the three states uh, localized well within the bulk of the Sitter. Now, when we do this counting, uh, the purpose is to see how this parametrization that we shown earlier come out from this microscopic counting exercise. Um, we are not counting fully the entropy, we're only counting a subset. And so you can regard this as a lower bound on the entropy from um, the tower of states. This is not the full entropy, but uh, th this is the best we can do with our current technologies to try, try to find a way to estimate the lower bound of this entropy coming from the tower of like states at the boundary of the moduli space. Okay, so the counting can be uh, done very easily if there are three particles. So suppose you have a single free field with a mass m. You put it inside a box of the size of the de Sitter radius, and you count the states up to a maximum momentum that we call k max. And so you can count the entropy. It scales with the volume of the box for this three particle states, and the associated energy also scale appropriately. So omega here is the energy of the individual uh, mode. And so you could, uh, since we are counting uh, states up to a maximum momentum, we can estimate the maximum energy and uh, en associate entropy with this, with this uh, box of free particle states. And in order to be self-consistent, we don't want to make that uh, box of states collapse into a black hole. And so uh, one way to prevent this from happening is to ensure that the structural radius is smaller than the box size. Okay. So this is, argument, again, is not very new. People have played this game before. Uh, in particular, uh, some earlier papers have used that to estimate the entropy coming from uh, free particle states in, in um, 
in the city space. Okay? If you do this exercise, you'll find that the tower of states contributes to, an, to the ent uh, entropy as the distance radius to the power of three halves. And, so, and also the maximum um, momentum that you can include in this counting goes as inverse square root of the distance radius. If you go further in the momentum states, you find that it would collapse into a black hole. So this tells you that if you have just three particle states, uh, it would not saturate the Boussel bar. It would still be weaker than the R square that you expect from the Zeta entropy. Um, now this is for a single free field. Uh, you, you see that it cannot saturate the Boussel bar, but it may be possible if you have a large number of uh, large uh, species of particles. Okay? So this is what we would uh, try to improve. So suppose you have n species of such particles. You can repeat the exercise, but perhaps it's easier to just go through the thermodynamics instead of just uh, for, for this uh, system of n species of three particles. Again, you can see how the entropy scales with the volume and uh, the associated energy. And here, um, the difference is that we have um, n species of states. And one argument that will simplify our life is to uh, note that to maximize the entropy for this n species, uh, we would like to regard all these different species to be in a thermal bath of a common temperature. You can convince yourself that if the different species have different temperature, the associated entropy will be smaller. To maximize the entropy, all the species were in a thermal bath with a common temperature, T. And so if you were, uh, again, to require that this uh, box of n species of particles not to form a black hole, you require that the structural radius to be smaller than the box size. And this turns into a condition on the temperature. It's uh, given in this form. And the associated entropy scale with R to the 3 half as expected. But additionally, there is a dependence on the number of species. So if you were to assume that this free particle states, this n species of free particle states, saturate the Boussel bound, the solution is uh, the number of species would grow as the square of the uh, this theta radius. So this would become out to the uh, two powers. And the corresponding temperature would go like one over the this theta radius. With the entropy associated with each of these to be of order one. Now this is a very extreme limit. Uh, this basically tells us that the temperature is the minimum possible. It's of the scale of the this uh, size. And the entropy associated with each of these species is the minimum possible. It's one uh, it's contributing one to the entropy per species. This rather extreme uh, limit, a very low temperature and a very low entropy per species, means that we are at really the borderline of thermodynamics. Uh, nonetheless, if you were just to count the number of states, if you're doing it more carefully, you can show that this would saturate the uh, this is the entropy. This would saturate the Boussel bound. So, um, Now, again, this is simply um, uh, an example. Okay. So if we would know a better way to count the entropy of this tower of states and not treating them as free particles and counting all the other possible states like black holes, we may get a different answer. But let's push on to see what this um, uh, simple estimate that we made uh, would tell us. Um, I mentioned that the decision conjecture is insensitive to the details of the microstate uh, counting, but the cosmology is, this is how it would affect the cosmology. Um, and if you were to apply uh, the De Sitter, uh, if you were to apply this counting, this free QFT states, uh, to saturate the Boussel bar as a way to estimate the entropy, you find that with our current uh, universe, with the De Sitter radius of the order of 10 to the 60, you find that the mass uh, of this tau the mass gap of this tower of states will be so light that it would not give rise to a realistic uh, scenario. Um, so you could make some simple estimate for that. Uh, so suppose you are considering a tower of states that are evenly spaced, doesn't have to be the case. And uh, there's a cutoff below which the n species contribute to the entropy. And you find that the mass range of this tower of states would be bounded by these two um, uh, range. And if you put in the numbers for the Desita radius, you find that this is a tiny, tiny mass. So this is not something that would be realistic, uh, as a dark, even as a dark matter, uh, even as a dark tower of uh, states. 
Uh, now, what that means is that under the assumption that it will saturate the entropy with these three particles, uh, you know, if the this theta entropy is, uh, is uh, saturated by these three particle states, then our current universe is not in a parametrically weak coupling regime. Now, there's a lot of if, uh, because it's not given that these three particle states saturate the entropy. But if they saturate the entropy, it's still not saying that we cannot get the sitter. It just means that the sitter, uh, uh, the sitter space describing our universe is not in the parametrically weak coupling regime where we draw these conclusions. Now, if you were able to find a different ways to count the microstates uh, uh, for this tower, let's say just for the purpose of phenomenology, if you take in take some uh, arbitrary numbers for this uh, exponents that appear in the entropy function, you can get more realistic scenario. I don't know how this kind of scenarios would come about, but you know, it's listen, at the moment since we don't know how to count the entropy, it is not completely uh, forbidden, at least as I, as I know. So one point that is interesting to point out is that uh, this power of states, uh, even though they may have a very light mass, uh, one point which makes that tower of states interesting is that as we have seen, the mass depends on the field, and the field is evolving. So that means that the tower of states is uh, time dependent as the quintessence field evolves and could in give rise to some interesting phenomenology as uh, studied by this uh, uh, recent paper. Okay, so are there any questions before I move to the other conjectures? Yes. In order to have an accelerating universe and uh, apparent horizon, you assume that the gradient of the uh, potential or potential is smaller than square two. So does it mean that uh, the, the C parameter in the decidus Svamlan conjecture is uh, smaller than square two? Uh, so, okay, so let me go back. Um, yeah, so you are, you are saying that, um, uh, so this C is determined by these parameters that I introduced. Yes. So it's typically of order one. Yes. Right. But in order to, uh, for this argument to uh, be consistent. That's right. So, so in order for this argument to be consistent, C has to be smaller than 1 over root 2. So it's yes. still roughly of order 1. Oh, I see. Right. So any other questions? Before? Okay. So, it's, uh, so this is the first part of the lecture. Um, the second part would be about the ADS instability conjecture. And what ties the two uh, conjectures, uh, at least in a loose way, is that they are both proposed consistency conditions for quantum gravity when there's no supersymmetries. So recall uh, that in the first lecture, we have already generalized the weak gravity conjectures to brains. So not only does it apply to one form, it applies to p-form as well. Schematically, the weak gravity conjecture for brains tells us that the tension of the brains has, you should be able to find a state whose, uh, you should be able to find a state such that the tension is smaller than its charge. And what the weak gravity conjecture really says is that any Coulombic force wins over gravity. So gravity is the weakest force. And so uh, what that means is that uh, if you apply it to brains, the, um, the force acting on the brains due to its charge would be stronger than the effects due to gravity. And in known examples, um, this weak gravity bound is saturated uh, only for supersymmetric theories and when the state under consideration is a BPS state. And so this led uh, Oguri and Waffa to conjecture that this inequality is straight in the absence of supersymmetry. So you could strengthen the weak gravity conjecture somewhat instead of putting an equal sign as a possibility in the absence of symmetry supersymmetry, the conjecture is that it becomes a straight inequality. Now, a 
uh, consequence of this strong version of the weak gravity conjecture uh, is, can be stated as follows, that non-supersymmetric ADS vacua are supported by fluxes are unstable. So there are flux vacua, there are ADS vacua that be, can be constructed by turning on fluxes. And uh, in such cases, um, uh, the, 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 the stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture implies that uh, there are instabilities associated with this uh, non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum. And a way to realize this instability is to consider a brain satisfying the weak gravity conjecture. So suppose you have one of these ADS vacuum, and the weak gravity conjecture, the strong form stated here, implies that there should be a brain whose charge is strictly bigger than its tension. And this tells us that the, uh, um, the, the, the Coulombic uh, repulsion would win over gravitational attractions. And so these brains, which uh, satisfy the inequality, could nucleate and expand and reaches the boundary of ADS space and uh, changes the flux quanta. Okay? So this is a cartoon of this instability. So um, you have a, a proposed ADS vacuum, and because of the presence of this weak gravity satisfying brain with charge bigger than this tension, um, it, this bubble wall, which uh, has stronger Coulombic repulsion, would uh, expand and take up a different ADS vacuum with, diff with a different unit of fluxes. And this conjecture originally uh, was stated only for flux vacuum, uh, but uh, O'Grey and Waffen further conjecture that this holds even for other ADS vacuum, not necessarily ones that are supported by fluxes, under some conditions. Uh, one of these conditions would be that the low energy description is Einstein gravity coupled to a finite number of fields. For instance, if you have higher spin theories where you have an infinite number of, high, of uh, low energy degrees of freedom, this conjecture would not apply. Now, this is a very interesting conjecture, if true, and the question is, how do we test this conjecture? Okay. So this brings me to a somewhat speculative topic. Um, and interestingly, to test this conjecture, uh, we can look at uh, the deep infrared of the standard model. Uh, if this conjecture in the strongest form would hold, namely any non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum would be unstable. It doesn't have to be a flux vacuum. We can just look at the standard model itself and see whether this conjecture is satisfied or not. Okay. So uh, the idea is the following. So if you look at the deep infrared of the standard model, the physics is very simple. Uh, there are only four bosonic degrees of freedom, uh, the photons and the graviton. And, and this is the deep infrared below the electron mass. And there are only six or 12 degrees of freedom, depending on whether the neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac. And um, the mass scale of the neutrinos, as far as we know, is uh, of the order of a tenth to a hundredth of an EV, although, there are, although it's not yet excluded whether one of the neutrinos is exactly massless. But this is the ball part of the neutrino mass that we know. And the only infrared scale of that order that we know is the cosmological constant. And this coincidence between the neutrino mass scale and the cosmological constant scale has been a constant source of inspiration or speculations. And so what I'm going to do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to uh, apply the ADS instability conjecture and see if we can make some statements relating these two uh, mass scales. Okay? Now, to test this conjecture, we don't have to actually go very far. Even the Higgs potential would do. Uh, we know that uh, the Higgs potential has the electroweak minimum, um, and this is presumably the minimum that we live in with a slight positive cosmological constant. But uh, with the measure value of the Higgs, we know that in addition to the Higgs vacuum, there's also a higher scale uh, vacuum with a Higgs vacuum expectation value of the order of the Planck scale. And this higher scale vacuum can be ADS, Minkowski, or De Sitter, depending on the top quark mass uh, and possible higher dimension operators that would come in. So the Higgs potential uh, is subject to higher order uh, operator corrections. And depending on how big these corrections are, you could uh, generate a minimum at around the Planck scale with an energy that is De Sitter, Minkowski, or uh, anti-De Sitter. So if this conjecture is right, namely any anti-de-sitter 
non-supersymmetric vacuum are unstable, uh, you could exclude some of these possibilities. Namely, you can put a constraint on the top quark mass or some of these higher dimensional operators that could um, uh, correct the Higgs potential. Moreover, uh, if you were to go further by compactifying the standard model to lower dimensions, there are other statements you can make. So if you were to compactify the standard model uh, down to three dimensions or less, you find that there is, a, in addition uh, to the, um, you will find that there is a contribution coming from the Casimir energy. So this is a, a quantum effect uh, when you reduce uh, the theory on the circle or with any compact space. And there are two competing effects here. Uh, one is the Casimir effects that tends to strain the compact space. And there is another effect, which is the um, uh, cosmological constant that tends to compact, decompactify the dimensions. So the question is whether these two competing effects would give rise to a minimum. And if the minimum is anti-de-sitter, you can apply the anti-de-sitter conjecture to, to, um, uh, to constrain the type of uh, uh, um, masses of the neutrinos that could contribute to the Casimir energy. So in a little bit more detail, okay, um, if you were to compute the Casimir energy coming from loops of these particles, it would depend on the mass of the particle, the spin of the particles, the number of degrees of freedom, as well as the boundary conditions. And since we are looking at the infrared, the deep infrared of the standard model, the contributing degrees of freedom are only very few. Uh, the bosonic degrees of freedom, uh, there are only four of them. And since they are bosons, they contribute uh, negatively to the, to the potential. The Casimir energy contributions is negative. Uh, whereas the positive cosmological constant that we observe uh, obviously contribute positively, and the two effects compete. And if you were to ask, the, uh, so at large uh, radius, if you look at uh, this compact circle when the radius r is very large, uh, the cosmological constant contributions dominate, and it would try to decompactify the theory. Whereas if you go to the small radius regime, the Casimir energy dominates. It will try to shrink. And if you were to compare the effects of the two, you find that the crossover is around 40 microns, which is not far from uh, the neutrino mass scale. So the neutrino would also contribute to the Casimir energy, and it could give rise to a competing effect, uh, depending on whether the neutrino mass is of is bigger or small compared with the cosmological constant. You can get De Sitter, Minkowskian, or anti De Sitter. OK, so um, if you were to, to do these calculations, you find that um, the Casimir energy effects is only important when the mass of the particle is smaller than the compactification uh, uh, energy scale. And so um, I won't bore you with the details, but if you were to actually carry out these calculations, you find that uh, there's some difference between Majorana neutrinos and Dirac neutrinos. Okay. And the difference is that uh, there are twice as many degrees of freedom of the Dirac neutrinos. And so since fermions contribute, in uh, so co fermions contribute oppositely as bosons, it would contribute more positively if you have more neutrino degrees of freedom. And hence, uh, the in the case of the Dirac neutrino, you can possibly get something other than anti de Sitter if the neutrino masses are sufficiently light. Whereas in the case of the Majorana neutrinos, the only option for you is an ADS minimum. So if you take this ADS uh, instability conjecture seriously, you would say that Majorana neutrinos, without any additional new physics beyond the standard model, suppose you have just the standard model and you have only neutrinos, uh, uh, the Majorana neutrinos uh, case would be incompatible with the conjecture. So this is just to illustrate how this minimum comes about. It's a competition between three contributions, the cosmological constant, the bosonic contributions, which is negative, and the contributions from the neutrinos. And the, the Sitter minimum is, uh, in, and the minimum that you obtain is a competition between these three effects. And there's some qualitative difference between uh, Dirac neutrino and Majorana neutrino because they have different degrees of freedom. And so it would seem to suggest that uh, if you have just the standard model with minimum ne Majorana neutrino, uh, with only the uh, neutrinos, uh, 
And in simple scenario with minimum Majorana neutrino mass, seems to give rise to a, not, to a supersymmetric ADS vacuum. Okay? So could it be that this scenario is in a small land? Okay? Uh, this is not the case, as it turns out, because if you were to think more carefully, you find that there is some instability of this non supersymmetric ADS minimum. Okay? The reason is that um, uh, we should not forget that when you compactify the theory on the circle, other than having this uh, scalar field, you also have uh, the associate Wilson lines. And the, press, the fact that there are charged states in the standard model will stabilize this Wilson line to some value. Once you stabilize this Wilson line value, you find that the contributions from the neutrinos would become, um, once you stabilize the Wilson lines by the, some heavy charged particles, it would make the fermion contributions negative. Okay? So that means that there is an even lower ADS energy minimum uh, at smaller distance scale corresponding to this charged particle states. In particular, if you go to the neutrino mass scale, you already find a lower energy ADS minimum. So the ADS instability conjecture itself cannot rule out any of these standard model uh, landscape scenarios where the, you, know, you cannot say anything definitive about the neutrino mass, how it relates to the neutrino mass and type and how it relates to the cosmological constant. Uh, okay, so before I move on, are there any questions about this point? Okay, so um, now since we are in the spirit of making conjectures, if this uh, ADS instability conjecture fails to give us any uh, constraint on the neutrino mass and type with the cosmological constant. Nonetheless, it's uh, very tempting to make such uh, conjectures because A, the scale of the two are very much related. And if we were able to tie this two scale, it would be fantastic. So is there any other way to connect the neutrino scale with the cosmological constant scale? Okay. Uh, now, this is a somewhat more speculative uh, uh, conjectures that were made a while ago. Uh, like the ball quantization conditions, this conjecture uh, is not motivated by string theory at all. Nonetheless, it has some success in predicting the Higgs mass. So the conjecture is the following. Um, so if you demand that uh, the th um, parameter to the, of the theory would be such that there are as many degenerate phases as possible, you can apply it to the Higgs potential. And by that, you can make a predictions about the Higgs uh, mass uh, based on what we know about the top quark mass and uh, so on. And it was done back many years ago before uh, the Higgs discovery. The numbers that were predicted from this multi-point principle turned out to be not too bad compared with the measured value. Okay. Um, now, um, if you apply this multi-point principle to theories with uh, when you compactify the standard model landscape, and if you demand that uh, there are as many degenerate vacua as possible, namely, in addition to the vacuum that we live in, there's another vacua which has the same, or roughly the same, cosmological constant, you, again, can arrive at a similar statement, namely that the cosmological constant scale can be tied to the neutrino mass scale. Okay? Um, so, but this is probably bringing us too far away from the theme of these lectures, so let me I'll skip over that. And uh, let me just conclude. Okay. So this is the slide that I um, show you in the beginning of the set of lectures. Uh, the point I wanted to make earlier was that this set of conjectures are intimately related. The fact that they fit together in this intricate web gives us some confidence uh, that uh, perhaps there's some more universal statement we can make, maybe not explicit in the form that was stated by this conjecture, but a much more meta statement we can make that unify the various statements about quantum gravity. And so after this set of lectures, you see how some of these conjectures are related. Um, so in the first lectures, we talk about uh, the absence of global symmetries. There were even uh, proof of that in certain 
uh, limiting cases, for instance, in perturbative string theory and through holography, we can show that um, a consistent quantum theory of gravities would not give rise to exact global symmetries. And the weak gravity conjecture can be thought of as an upgrade of the statements. Um, when the coupling uh, constant is, um, so the, um, a global symmetry can be thought of as a gauge symmetry with a vanishing coupling. When the coupling is not exactly zero, uh, we would like to know when do things go wrong and what is the lower bound of the coupling um, that is consistent. And the weak gravity conjecture gives us a way to constrain how weak the coupling can be. It, stay, it can be stated in the form that gravity is the weakest force, namely that you can always find a charged state whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than one in uh, Planck units. And so the weak gravity conjecture can be thought of as an upgrade of the statement that there's no global symmetries in quantum gravity. Now, if you refine the weak gravity conjecture to uh, a strict inequality, not only do you find a super extremal or extremal states, but by requiring this to be a strict inequality for non-supersymmetric theory, uh, it has been argued that it leads to the conjecture that non-supersymmetric ADS vacuum are unstable. Okay, so this is what we described today. Um, also in the first lecture, we mentioned that consistencies, um, point dimensional reductions, suggest stronger versions of the weak variety conjecture. Um, there are versions of the weak variety conjecture known as the tower weak variety conjecture or the sublattice weak variety conjecture that requires infinitely many charged states satisfying the weak gravity bound. Now, there are conjectures that seem naively unrelated. For instance, the distance conjecture and the De Sitter conjecture. And as it turns out, the stronger versions of the weak gravity conjecture can be thought of as special cases of the distance conjecture. As you send the gauge coupling to zero, which takes us to the boundary of the moduli space, indeed, you find that a tower of states uh, becomes exponentially light, as the distance conjecture suggests. And we have also uh, drawn our connections between the distance conjecture and the de Sitter conjecture through entropy arguments at weak couplings. Okay? So, I hope in this set of lectures, I gave you the, at least the impression, that this web of interconnected swarmland conjectures are interesting, and they also give rise to possible uh, variety of applications in cosmology and particle physics, and we have described some of them. In the last lecture, uh, I have uh, uh, mentioned that uh, because there is a global experimental effort in trying to detect gravitational waves imprinted on the CMB, the a detection at the target level of the order of r of the order of 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 would strongly suggest that inflation is the inflationary potential is flat over a super Planckian field range. And we can use the weak gravity conjecture to argue that some of these large field inflation models are in the swarmland, uh, although uh, some models could evade this bound. Some interesting examples would be uh, models of inflations that involve spectator instantons or axiom monodromy models. Now, um, the De Sitter conjecture the swarmland also has something interesting to say about the current universe. In particular, the De Sitter conjecture suggests the possibility that uh, the current dark energy can be realized as a quintessence field whose observational consequences can be tested experimentally at some of these experiments. Um, now, if you refine the weak gravity conjecture for brains to straight inequality, it leads to the so-called ADS instability conjecture. And this could lead to some interesting consequences in particle physics in relating neutrino masses or some BS and beyond the standard model scenario with the observed cosmological constants. And in the last few lectures, I have shown you how the weak variety conjecture can be proven, at least for a wide class of theories that can be naturally realized in string theory. If you recall, uh, the assumption is that in such theories, either you have some like degrees of freedom, some like bosons below the string scale, if you have such uh, theories, you can use unitarity and causality to prove uh, a mild form of the weak gravity conjecture uh, would hold. Uh, another possibility is if the theory contains different towers of higher spin states. If the uh, Reggie tower associated with the graviton is different from the Reggie tower associated with the photons, the same type of arguments could apply. Namely, you can show that uh, a large extremal black hole can decay to a smaller extremal black hole, and hence, uh, a mile for the weak variety conjecture holds. And in the lecture today, I have pointed out a 
possible connections between the distance conjecture and a refined con con version of the De Sitter conjecture. And I should emphasize that this connection can only be made in the parametrically weak coupling regime. And this led naturally to the refined De Sitter conjecture. Uh, either one of these conditions would need to be satisfied if we are in the parametrically weak coupling regime. Interestingly, uh, even though this is not our motivation, this refinement of the De Sitter conjecture can evade uh, some of the counter examples that have been raised uh, regarding potential maxima. Um, and so this is a good place to stop, and I uh, would just like to thank uh, you for your attention. So our universe, our standard model, are we in such a boundary? Are, are we approaching there? And if it is, uh, do we really have such a bunch of light states? Uh, so I, I don't know. So we may be in the interior of the modularized space, in which case uh, the dyne cyber problem would, would be an issue. Um, it, uh, uh, the fact that we don't have parametric control does not mean that we have no control. It's just harder. So you have to be able to justify why the higher order corrections do not play a role. And that probably is a more likely uh, scenario. It's just pointed to the fact that we have to work harder to get the sitter. Um, and if we were actually in the parametrically recoupling regime, if we were, uh, if we were, if we have a better understanding of uh, of uh, string theory, we would actually know what is the dual description instead of thinking about this tower of like states. Yeah, so, so I should also mention that this tower of states is a dual description. Uh, it doesn't have to be the, the only description, right? right. So, so in the same way that, uh, let's say, if you start from a heterotic string, if you crank up the coupling, you should go to type 1. You could have two options. Either you know the type 1 description directly, in which case it's a better way of doing physics, or you describe it in terms of a whole tower of states that do not uh, exist in the original point in the modular space. So either the, uh, so I would view it as a dual description of the physics. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to actually see this tower of states. Yeah. So uh, this is a very pragmatic question. So <laughs> with your the Sita conjecture established, can you just pragmatically suggest to us string theorists what would be the most important problem we should think about on the Zeta problem? I so, just want to know where I should go. <laughs> right. So, so, no, I think, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not closing any door, rather it's opening a lot more possibilities. Uh, in particular, how to stabilize moduli and get uh, stabilized vacuum with positive energy, it's not excluded by this type of argument. It just means that we are not in the parametrically weak coupling regime, uh, it would be in a regime where the coupling constant is not far from one, so we will have to have some control of high order corrections. So it actually uh, motivates us to, to develop stronger machinery to understand you know, modular stabilizations and related issues. So you're just saying that the system problem within strong theory, string theory will be technically much more challenging. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you. Regarding ADS instability, but don't we have non-supersymmetric ADS fixed points in the supergravity already? Right. So, so the question is whether you can find uh, a, a way for this ADS vacuum to decay to something else. Right. So we, I mean, there are, there are apparent ADS vacuum, but then there could be other channel for it to decay to. So the conjecture only tells us that if you have non-supersymmetric ADS vector, you are going to find some possible way for it to, to be unstable. Right. So people have tried to find counterexamples. It's hard to find a counterexample that, uh, that, that, that ensures its full stability. So in, in particular, uh, as I've gone through even a much more mundane, uh, simple example, 
just compactifying the standard model on uh, a circle, you naively thought that there's an ADS minimum, right? Just by balancing the neutrino contributions with the Casimir energy with a cosmological constant, you find a minimum somewhere. Uh, it's not so clear from this picture, but then there's an ADS minimum. But if you look more closely, there's a decay channel. The decay channel is uh, an ADS minimum that is even uh, lower. At least we know that there's a channel for it to decay to because um, the, uh, the electrons which is charged under the, uh, electric, under the standard model U1 would be charged under the Wilson lines. The Wilson line would be one of the things that we need to stabilize. So there's a, 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 another way for the ADS vacuum to, 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 to go into. Are there more questions? Okay. Uh, so, so no, this um, non susy ADS conjecture, does it preclude all, um, like, any kind of non supersymmetric CFT that can be, uh, that is holographic? Mm. Right. So, this is, again, uh, it's under the assumption that we have only Einstein gravity. So, um, this is the, I mean, you can question the conjecture, but this is how it was stated. Uh, it's not for every single um, non-supersymmetric ADS vector. And it's only for non-supersymmetric ADS vector in theories where the low energy description is Einstein gravity with a finite number of degrees of freedom. So if, if it's not, um, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could have other uh, setup where you would have a, still a holographic dual. Uh, let's thank uh, Professor Gary Shu for his wonderful lecture.